Hey, good evening. How is everyone? Good, thank you. Well, you're in for a real treat. Uh, tonight is um, our Petra Kucha Night Hamptons Volume 38. So that we have done 38 of these programs, and they're one of our most popular programs because you get to meet all the creatives of the East End as they present their passions and their work. And if you do know uh, some creatives, or if you're a creative yourself, please uh, come up to us and let us know, um, and you're welcome to present here at the parish. So I would like to thank all the sponsors who make these evenings uh, possible. Uh, our presenting sponsor, Bank of America, Wild Cornell Medicine, Southampton, and the Corcoran Group. And I also want to thank my colleague, Olivia Mangini, who puts together these amazing programs. Yes, thank you, Olivia. And um, just for those of you who are not familiar with Petra Kucha, it's actually an international organization that was founded in 2003 by Astrid Klein and Mark Ditham, and it features a six minute and 40 second presentation while each image changes every 20 seconds. So people have really have to prepare for their presentations. Um, Pecha Kucha is the Japanese um, sound for chit chat, and it follows an exciting rapid fire format. The Hamptons is one of almost 1,300 cities worldwide that host Pecha Kucha nights and featuring more than 100,000 Pecha Kucha presentations. So, and tonight, in addition to the Hamptons, Pecha Kucha is also taking place in Auckland, New Zealand, in Gloucester, UK, and Miami, Florida, as well as Panjim, India, and Ostrava in the Czech Republic. So we're in very good company. All right, let's get started with our first presenter, Denise Gale. Um, she's a painter and lives in the Springs. Denise Gale is a native of St. Louis, Missouri, and she studied art at California State College at Northridge, at Northridge. After graduation, Denise moved to a loft in downtown Pasadena, where there was a vital art scene in the early 1970s. Her work has been included in exhibitions in San Diego, St. Louis, Chicago, and Cincinnati, before moving to New York City in 1980 where she had solo exhibitions at the Painting Center and 55 Mercer. Denise um, was featured in the 2020 book, Hampton's Artists, The Current Wave, published by Folio East. Please give a warm welcome to Denise. I'm going to try to um, not mess up the computer or something. Um, thank you, everybody. Uh, I always wanted to be an artist. I always wanted to be a painter, especially after I saw uh, William de Kooning painting at the Washington University Art Gallery. Uh, I was madly in love with de Kooning and painting, and it changed my life. I'm going to put this on here. OK. So when I was living, I went to school in LA. When I was in Los Angeles, I had two lofts. And I was pouring paint on the floor. The canvases were on the floor. And I took uh, wood and squeegeed them across. And I would make the uh, composition that way. So this is the, the uh, red one is a later one. Uh, I was still in Los Angeles. I have a lot of work. I lived in New York City, and I never really could get into my paintings the way that I can here or in LA. In LA, it was, I was young, I was unencumbered, and in New York, I had a family, and I, I'm not the kind of artist. This is called uh, Ground Control to Major Tom, the yellow one. And it's, by the time I got to Springs, I was painting against the wall and with brushes, and using lines, pretty much always have been doing the same things. The pink painting is called Entangled. And um, also, I see I have dates here on this thing, right? And um, the green painting is called Pistachio, and that's from 2014. So uh, I was, when I got to the Springs, I got to have sanctum time. I never really could. Uh, I'm never the kind of artist that can rush in and paint and then go pick up your kid and then go to the grocery store. So this has really been a wonderful 
uh, time for me, very fruitful and great. And then I started doing in, let's see, what was the date? This is 2016. Um, this is a diptych. I started doing diptychs. Um, I was always interested in doing them, and I never could figure out why people would paint not just on one canvas. And then I started playing around with it, and I loved it. So the green painting you just saw, I'm going behind, I'm talking too much, um, is called um, Rethinking Barry White. The white piece with this is called White Scrunchy, and it is on paper. Um, so now I have some more time. Anyway, I'm, at this point, uh, I think this is like uh, 2017, I went back to single canvases, and it, I started opening up the center of the canvas, less opaque layers. Uh, before that, there was all the goodies, the drips and everything around the sides, but I started opening everything up. The black and white um, piece is from a series I did called, um, uh, what was it called? Oh, they're all named after Alfred Hitchcock movies, and that's called The 39 Steps. It's homage to Alfred Hitchcock, who's my favorite director. The, this is called, the purplish one is called Extreme Bonkers. And Donald Trump was president at that time, so as you can see, I was influenced by that. But um, the, the um, strokes start to get more open, and honestly, as I'm looking at these and putting all this together, I realize how much I'm sort of gone completely in a circle, because these are sort of like the paintings that I really started doing when I was in California. Um, the green painting is called, I'm, oh, it's called Oh Happy Day. And the brown painting is called Boss. Um, again, I am still, you know, using a crayon stick, I mean, um, oil stick, and uh, working against the wall and layering, layering. And this last one, this, the one that's coming up, oh, the pink one is called Thug Life, and that's from 2019. And the one that's coming up with the brown strokes is, this is a long title, ridiculous, but uh, Dominique Sanda Running in the Woods in the Conformist by Bertolucci. I mean, you could, it's like a book. Anyway, um, so uh, th there was a scene that just has always remained in my mind. Um, the next painting, uh, I'm back to diptychs again. Uh, this is fairly recent. It's 2022, um, and it is called Purple. Very simple. Um, it's I think it's 72 by 48. So now, the past three months, I started working on paper again, and I've always worked on paper, but I don't know what's going on, but I'm like in, in obsessed with it. I'm going crazy, I'm painting on paper all the time. I think about it, I can't wait to get back to it. And it's just a great feeling. And um, these are, I don't have the title for any of these because I didn't title them. But um, so it's been a very rich, great thing is this working on paper. And it's almost like, I swear I didn't drop acid when I tell you the story, but. It's like when I'm working on canvas and it's very physical and then I'm, ah, that's my arena, that's my body, this is how I'm doing it. But this is the first time since I've been working on paper where I feel like I'm in, in the painting, that I'm really, really exploring this, this eight by 11, uh, you know, uh, piece of work. So um, now everything, is not just about paint and strokes and splatters and all that kind of stuff, you know, that my paintings do do. You know, I mean, I, I've been trained as an artist. I know how to do all that stuff. But um, I think that there's, what I'm getting at is that there's something more that I'm trying to get to the viewer through me. And if anybody enjoys my paintings as much as I enjoy the William de Kooning painting, then I will feel successful. All right. <laughs> Can I?
Thank you, Denise. It's uh, really interesting to see how you channel your sentiments about notable people like Trump and Hitchcock into your abstractions. <laughs> so, all right, next up is Doug Block. He is a longtime documentary filmmaker whose films have been seen widely in theaters and broadcast on television throughout the world. Doug's work has received critical acclaim and top awards from festivals including Sundance, Berlin and Tribeca, as well as Emmys, Peabody's, uh, and Peabody's. His films were named in the top 10 films of the year by the New York Times, National Board of Review, and AARP. And his last three films, which are 51 Birch Street, The Kids Grow Up, and 112 Weddings, were broadcasted on HBO. Congratulations. Doug is also the founder and co-host of The D Word, the leading online community for the documentary professionals worldwide, worldwide now in its 23rd year. Please welcome Doug. Um, thanks, Karen. I, I um, have a little confession to make before I start. I totally miscalculated and thought I had six minutes to talk, and I came here and learned I had six minutes and 40 seconds. So I will try and talk a little slower than I think I normally would, but like I may be way off. Um, um, so, you know, for the past few weeks, I've been mulling uh, what I talk about here tonight, and well, this being a museum and all, I um, thought I'd talk about art and um, particularly what goes into calling oneself an artist. Um, am I myself an artist? Um, well, I have been a documentary filmmaker for uh, the past 35 years. And um, you know, as, as the intro said, my films have played, um, um, did I not click this thing? It's not, it doesn't seem to be. Okay, now, now I'll talk really slow. <laughs> um, you know, I, I, you know, they've, they've, as Corinne said, they've played in theaters and they've been broadcast um, throughout the world. And they've, um, yeah, you know, they've gotten their fair share of acclaim and awards and all that sort of stuff. And, um, you know, again, as it was mentioned, I forgot what I wrote in my bio, so I'm, I don't mean to repeat myself. But, you know, it was, uh, you know, the New York Times lead film critic A.O. Scott called uh, 51 Birch Street uh, a work of art and um, named it one of the top 10 films of the year. Um, and yet, despite all of that, um, I've always been extremely uncomfortable calling myself an artist. Um, and I'm not really sure why. Um, maybe it's because, you know, when I think of artists, I think of, uh, you know, Monet and his incredible use of color, Hopper, Sargent, Van Gogh cutting his ear off. Um, you know, whereas filmmaking is a, a really collaborative art. So I've always thought of myself simply as a filmmaker. Um, but tonight I want to talk about uh, an ex unexpected path my creative life has taken in recent years. And it's, it's actually all thanks to this sucker here. Um, I've always enjoyed taking photos, but since the advent of the iPhone, um, you know, I've kind of taken it to a whole new level. Um, you know, the phone has uh, changed, well, it's really, changed my entire relationship to uh, photography. The idea that I don't have to lug it around a heavy camera anymore, that it's always right there in my pocket and I can whip it out when something catches my eye or the light is just so. Um, I usually fire off a bunch of photos quickly and move the camera around and, you know, if I see something interesting in the frame, even if it's over in a corner, I just kind of resize it and play with the composition. And then I use basic Instagram filters to play with color saturation and brightness and warmth. And sometimes if I play around with it enough, it starts to look sort of like a painting, which I love because, you know, paintings are art. <laughs> um, by the way, notice how many times I've said the word play. 
Um, documentary fundraising is so difficult. And um, it, it means long stretches of time where, you know, I'm doing everything but the creative work I crave doing. So photography has become my creative outlet. Um, but always just a hobby. Um, lots of people, including my wife, have um, encouraged me to start selling my photos. And I'd like to, but I don't know. Part of the fun is not having to deal with it as a business. Um, I get my fill of that with, with my documentary work. Um, playing around with photos. Um, oh, uh, you know, I take the train to the city pretty often. And about a year ago, I found myself sitting by one of their smudgy, translucent windows and um, started clicking away through it madly as the train sped past, like, you know, the dreary suburbs I grew up in. And uh, playing around with the photos later, I was, I was kind of astonished. They felt dreamy and magical, and at least according to my supportive wife, um, maybe even works of art. But again, did that make me an artist? Um, I still didn't think so. It was just so easy and fun. Um, it was kind of limiting to be dependent on the Long Island Railroad for creating art. So I fashioned a homemade blur filter out of the side of an empty milk carton in a plastic bag and suddenly had the freedom to take dreamy images wherever I went. Uh, this would pretty much be the end of my story with me happily taking photos for pure fun and amusement and nearly getting run, run over because I'm walking around the city streets holding a homemade filter over my, my lens. Um, uh, I shouldn't have held that up. I lost my place completely. <laughs> but anyway, a few months ago, totally out of the blue, I received this art inquiry from a guy named David Barlow asking about my beautiful artworks, asking if I accept checks should have been my first red flag. <laughs> but instead, I'm, I'm totally flattered and ask if he's looking for especially colorful ones. He responds, he responds, it could be any color, medium size or large canvas, soft landscapes, abstracts, figurative, modern, black and white, <laughs> portraits preferably, or an original painting. <laughs> Oh, and he wants them very large. I'm, I'm embarrassed to say how many times I sent follow-up emails. Um, I start researching what I should charge. I find a top-of-the-line lab, make a large print, and frame it to see how it looks. And I'll be damned, but it looks like something I might see in a museum. Um, needless to say, it turned out way too good to be true. And that was that. Um, Shortly after, a friend informed me the guy is a notorious scammer of artists. <laughs> but instead of getting mad, I thought, hmm, artists. He doesn't scam documentary filmmakers. He scams <laughs> artists. <laughs> I guess the moral of the story is it, it wasn't enough for me to be validated by the great A.O. Scott of the New York Times. I had to be validated by one David Carlo, notorious scammer of artists. <laughs> to finally take ownership of being an artist. <laughs> By the way, just saying, but my photos are available for sale online at dougblock.com. Um, they can be any color, medium size or large, <laughs> canvas, soft landscapes or abstracts, figurative or modern, and I recommend you get them very large. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you, Doc. Um, I should share some of the scam emails that we receive every day. <laughs> but I guess, you know, to answer your question about um, who is an artist, I think as long as you declare you are an artist, you are one. And that um, New York City street scene was pretty much like an Edward Hopper-esque um, photograph, right? Okay, on to the next. Um, I have to push an arrow here. Okay. Um, Esperanza Leon was born in Caracas, Venezuela, and raised in East Hampton, and partly educated in Toronto, Canada. She has sought to advance art and design from Latin America for over 25 years, opening Art Solar in East Hampton in 2001. Esperanza was a founding member of OLA of Eastern Long Island, 
which uh, is a partner of ours as well, a former Guildhall trustee and currently serves on the East Hampton Town Architectural Review Board, the Peconic Land Trust Project Committee, and Brooks Park Arts and Nature Center Committee. Preserving the Springs home and studio of abstract expressionist artists James Brooks and Charlotte Park. And to that I have to say, we have a James Brooks exhibition coming up next year. Yes. Uh, devoted to art and arch architecture, Esperanza resides in Wainscott with her family. Please welcome Esperanza. Thank you so much. And uh, I had forgotten that wonderful introduction. <laughs> oh, no, no, no. What did I do? Yeah. Okay, so once I'm there, then I just hit the right arrow once. Okay. I knew that would happen if I brought this up. Okay. So come on a journey with me. In the early summer 2021, a handful of neighbors from Wainscott saved this little house, a significant feature of our built landscape on Wainscott Hollow Road. If we didn't move it, the building would be demolished along with the 1938 potato barn next to it. Once part of the Strong family farm, this parcel was a cherished view shed. We presume the little house was as old as the barn. Oral accounts said it was tenant housing for African-American farm workers. We later discovered it originally stood in the schoolyard down the road, used as the potties for the late 19th century school that you see here. <clears throat> um, in the long tradition of moving and repurposing buildings, both were moved around 1930 to make way for the fourth schoolhouse that remains there today. How does an art history major specialized in Latin American art arrive at historical preservation in East Hampton? For one, I grew up in East Hampton of the 70s and 80s when views like this of the Dankowski farm were the norm. East Hampton's long-term parking lot was a farm field. Wainscott today retains much of that character. Still, the difference between that view that you just saw and this one from our apartment in Caracas is obviously striking. It is perhaps because I had one foot there and the other here, sort of an outsider in both, I learned to appreciate the distinct character of each place, both of which are part of my identity. I am part product of the Venezuela Saudita, a country rich in resources that for decades fueled industry, development, innovation, art, and architecture. The 1940s on produced art move movements like the Cinetics, symbolizing progress. Since the 70s, transit through Simon Bolivar Airport has been marked by this immersive mo mosaic by Cruz Diez, a master of movement through color. But Venezuela is a study in contrast. What I call spontaneous architecture has continuously sprouted from lush mountainsides creating densely populated barrios which today are ruled by pandillas or gangs. It's a fine line between chaos and control. In my childhood, though, it was a place of progress and promise. That was my mother's Caracas, the beginning of modernity. El Silencio, designed by Carlos Raúl Villanueva in the early 40s, redeveloped an impoverished sector, demolishing houses, bars, and brothels to improve the cityscape and life through planning, architecture, and art. From urban environment in Caracas to countryside in East Hampton was quite a transition in 1976. My parents purchased a house in the village having only peeked inside through the picture windows facing the backyard. The realtor had forgotten the keys. She became a family friend and we moved into a slice of Americana with, the mis with this mid-century ranch. Yards were open, neighbors brought pies and shared Thanksgiving feasts and Memorial Day barbecues. I walked and biked to shops, the beach, and school. Many classmates and staff were descendants of East Hampton's founding families, and I came to know, also, of Montaukets. Around the corner, Guild Hall involved me in theater and visual arts. I square danced, paint, painted faces, and sold pies at the LVIS at Mulford Farm, and I delighted in visiting Home Sweet Home and other historical sites during school field trips. These places were alive to me, not frozen in time. East Hampton's heritage became a part of mine. I have been fortunate to live in a place imbued with history and cultural heritage. East Hampton preserved that heritage at first simply by remaining a small rural community and by the 1960s and beyond through preservation strategies. 
This is largely the reason why the Mulford Farm etched in 1929 by Child Hassam that we just saw remains today captured by Jeff Heatley in the photo of East Hampton's colonial buildings. My return to Venezuela in the 90s was a challenge, but an awakening that I sought, a shift away from the art world center to a creative periphery that I confirmed had its pioneers and historical significance. The Avila Mountain still posed majestically over the Caracas Valley, but almost the almost 430-year-old city was not like that painted by Manuel Cabré in the 60s. Change is unrelenting, but remnants of the past could, could and can still be found as posted on Instagram by Marie Lee Cole. Traditional colonial red roof buildings um, uh, with wood doors and shutters and iron bars and tall windows remain in La Pastora where my grandmother lived as a child. Caracas grew, until the 1940, grew slowly until the 1940s when the once verdant landscape exploded with industry and development. Urban planning was essential to controlling growth and ushered in modern art and architecture. This is another picture of Marie Lee Cole. Some of these neighbors, neighborhoods, early and modern, retained their historic character and survived wars, coups, redevelopment, negligence, and earthquakes. Marie Lee Cole's posts of facades induce nostalgia and surprise at how structures survive in a country mired in political, social, and financial dysfunction. They're also a reminder of a place so different from here. There, I accepted living behind walls and gates, a proliferation of gates is not something I want to see in East Hampton, but it's happening. These three mid-century buildings and neighborhoods in Caracas mark my past, where they were constant, and you can also appreciate that walls and gates were a norm of city dwelling, specific to the culture and security measure. One grows accustomed down there. In Caracas, my first job at the Museo de Arte Contemporáneo, which is the brutalist spaces built into the lower levels of Parque Central, gave me access to a world-class international art collection. I experienced the cultural history of Caracas and Venezuela in the context of world history. My meanderings through places and architecture concludes back in East Hampton, where I returned in 2000. Perspective gained in Venezuela and my sense of East Hampton lands me on the Architectural Review Board. In 2020, I voted against the Brooks Park Studio demolition and I joined the group working to preserve this site. Art and preservation unite. Circling back to another opportunity to resist the passing of time, the little house was dismantled and stored in the summer of 2021 and a new organization founded the Wayne Scott Heritage Project. The building's story awaits being told. For now, it is the little house that was replaced by a big house, something that increasingly happens in our area and is erasing our sense of place. History and sense of place are vital. Erwin Levy and I talk about this on, on, the, on the R. Hamptons podcast launched this year. In Venezuela, historical structures have been abandoned and destroyed, important connections to the past lost. Those that are preserved are a testament to the people who protect cultural patrimony. East Hampton, our communities today, must step up to protect what remains of the past. We must urge our local governments to make legislative changes to maintain what is left. Change and reinvention must involve connection to the past. And thanks for following me on that journey from curator to preservationist. <laughs> Thank you, uh, Esperanza, and thank you for sharing uh, these amazing photos also from um, the past, you know, uh, historical photos of this area. And it's always interesting to see how our experiences from where we grew up uh, influence um, our work today. And th there couldn't be a greater, um, you know, difference or contrast between Caracas and, and Wainscott, I guess. Um, okay, next. Next is Victor Miranda, uh, an experienced and award-winning filmmaker, photographer, audio engineer, and musician. Victor Miranda has over 10 years of experience in the industry and has played at venues like Webster Hall and Queens Theater. You never told us that. Miranda has uh, Victor has worked with artists including Joan Osborne, Blue Oyster Cult, CeeLo Green, The Wailers, and more. Victor has won awards for his work, including Best Feature Film at NYLIFF, the New York Long Island Film Festival, in 2021, and Best Music Video at the same um, 
festival in 2022. A former Parish Art Museum staff member, and boy, do we miss you, Victor, <laughs> for events like this. You never lost your cool, so yeah. Um, so throughout his career, Victor has worked at many venues and production companies. He is now the owner of Vision Maker Productions, based in Hampton Bays, and here he strives to realize his client's vision through artistic video creations. Well, please give Victor a welcome. Come back. Hello. Um, so, well, first, a special thank you to the parish for inviting me to speak and giving me this opportunity. And a special thanks to also my family for being in attendance. And, uh, and thanks for joining me on this journey. So growing up with ADHD, I had a lot of energy. So, but my parents chose to not go the traditional route of medication and decided to help me learn to manage my energy. So I've done every sport under the sun, but I also did music uh, with piano lessons early on. And that was my first introduction to the creative field. Then when I moved here to Hampton Bays, I was invited to uh, Ponquag Battle of the Bands, which is at the beach in Hampton Bays. And that's when I had the first realization that um, kids and teenagers can actually play on stage, and it wasn't just like adult bands, you know. And uh, so I turned to my friends immediately who were just starting to learn their instruments and said, hey, we need to start a band. We got to get on there. In a few years, we actually got to compete in the punk rock battle, and we won first place. And this is us in uh, 27 East. And uh, from there in high school, I joined. I've been a part of a couple of bands over the years. I still play today. And we, like in my bio, we had opportunities to play Webster Hall. I opened up an international fashion show at Queen's Theater and everything in between. And, uh, and the big thing with drumming is that it also opened up to me with what I call a creative dialogue. Because in music, it's very non-linear conversation, in my opinion. It's your thinking past, present, and future simultaneously with what's coming next, what's happening now, what is every instrumentalist doing, and you're having a conversation with your bandmates and with the crowd, and you're giving what my teacher would say, the music, the dignity it deserves. So, and you're trying to serve in the conversation, keep it going, and I feel that's how you create that synergy and uh, create art, in a sense, in this, in this format. So, and I feel that set up the foundation with how I approach most things in life going forward as a creative. From there, leaving high school, I wanted to be a part of the music industry one way or another. I discovered audio engineering as a path, so that's what I chose to do, is one way I'll be a part of the music. And uh, so, right out of high school, I started working with a local cover band called New Life Crisis. You may have heard of them. They've been Dan's best several times. I worked at my church as an audio engineer. I went to five towns, got my audio auto engineering degree. That's what these three different mixers uh, represent. And from there, I worked with production companies and venues across the tri-state and had those opportunities to work with like the Whalers and CeeLo and um, Joan Osborne at the Sac Harbor Fest here a number of years ago and other things like that. Um, and again, I found myself back in that creative dialogue where as an audio engineer, I felt more as a extra member of whatever band I was working with at the time where I'm conversating with them as they're playing uh, and reacting to, is that guitar or soloist taking a solo, I need to mix that in. And as this vocalist holding out a note, the effects will help it bring out the note in a soft fashion. And you're reading the energy of the crowd when it needs to be light, when it needs to be hard. And so it's more of an active mixing style for me. That's always been entertaining. Um, and that all accumulated to me eventually becoming the audiovisual coordinator here at the parish which I was for three years. And, uh, but around that exact same time, I met my now wife, and we started in a long uh, distance relationship, which ended up us meeting a lot in uh, Europe because of, uh, because of our circumstances, her being from Russia at the time. And on one of our first trips in Paris, she asked if I could bring a DSLR with me to take photos because she takes great photos. But during that trip, she barely asked for the camera. I ended up with the camera the whole time and just fell in love with taking photos and found myself again in that creative dialogue dynamic. Uh, but with the world now through the lens and just seeing compositions as I see them and throughout many trips and here in Long Island, the city, and. Uh, then finding that in the editing room and learning the tools of the editing room, learning how to 
build in that conversation because I feel like the tools and the electronic with the editing and post-production, those are just, it's just more vocabulary you can use in the creative uh, conversation. And as you learn your vocabulary, you're able to conversate more and have a more sophisticated engagement. So that's what I started to do with my photography. And then there was um, one pivotal point where I asked the, the prior director of this museum. Uh, I mustered up the courage to actually show her my photos and ask for an opinion. And uh, she gave me some very encouraging words and, and which really solidified my, my love for the visual aesthetic as well and continue to pursue it and combine it with my love for music. And this one actually I took in Greece at a ancient water mill, but I saw it and specifically took it because I was thinking of water mill here at the time. And um, then as I worked here, this also gave me the introduction into video. And the video uh, first was through a major triannual uh, exhibition they have here, Artists Shoes Artists where I was tasked with making 10 to 20 videos with barely any video experience and pretty much it's just, you know, you gotta figure it out. And uh, I did and I really loved the whole process and had the, the film, the culmination of that featured here. And uh, that started into a couple film friends seeing what I was doing and they invited me to become a cinematographer for their independent film, which I later became the director of photography, which later went on to win Best Feature at that film festival. It won three awards, Audience Choice, Best Feature, and uh, Best Supporting Actress. And uh, later, I took those same friends and we started a production company. And over the last two years, uh, I kept that uh, creative dialogue going with my clients and with what we do. I decided to call the production company Vision Maker Productions because uh, people come to us with a vision, but they don't know how to translate it to the visual to make it something tangible. So I, I found that we can be the realization through our creations in that sense and have that dialogue, see what it's asking for, see what the, the dignity the art deserves and have that conversation because I feel every project is independent. I treat that with every song and with every project is you're, you're trying to find what serves that, what is it calling for? And so I brought that philosophy into my life and I feel video is just that combination of the photography, the audio, my musical life and, uh, and just continuing on the same, but I like to call myself a creative for that reason because it's, it's the same process in every step and every journey. It's still just the same creative dialogue that gets me through. So I don't know what the future holds for me, but thank you for listening. Thank you, Victor. It's amazing how you work with someone for three years and you don't know half of what they do outside of work. <laughs> I guess that was because we were so busy. And, um, you know, usually someone is really good on stage or backstage, but this is just proof that you're good at everything. And, and I can tell you have a bright future no matter where you go. So thank you, Victor. Next is... Patricia Pickman Udell. She is a New York and Quag based artist working in painting, sculpture, and other media. Her current work is based on drawings and sculpture studies that she translates into graphic, colorful paintings, and she recently completed a large scale con concrete sculpture installation. She has a BFA in sculpture from the U University of Pennsylvania. Her work is currently on view at M Art House in Bantam, Connecticut. Please welcome Patricia. Hi everybody, thanks for coming out tonight. So I called this Ark in Line and then I was thinking maybe that wasn't the right title, but whenever I'm describing anything that I make, I'm always saying, well, it goes like this and like that. So it is sort of the way I visually see things, so it does carry through. Um, but so I, I tied the whole thing together with that, but I decided that that wasn't really what I wanted to talk about. And since I'm a painter and a sculptor, I thought I would talk about materials that I use first. This is plaster. It's very opaque and very matte and very white. And I do a lot of drawings, and that's how I create um, those pieces. And then my paintings are gouache, which is also matte, velvety surface. And my paintings are very much related to my sculptures. In fact, my 
Um, sculptures usually start first and I make them from drawings and you'll see as we go along. I'm not gonna talk about each individual um, slide, but I'm like, so what am I passionate about? And I decided to explain to you how a painting of mine evolves in the studio. Um, I've changed the scale from the original work you saw, which was a smaller intimate size. And I got this giant paper, it's 60 inches wide. It's watercolor paper and I take it down and I you know, cut a piece related to a sketch that I found that I think is, is worthwhile to go forward with. In fact, the next shot is a studio shot so you can sort of get an idea of the scale. And then I'm usually like so excited to start painting that I like in my clogs, I'm on the ladder and teeter tottering, but I finally get it up and you know, make a border and I loosely make some type of drawing that's based on the sketch that I've selected. And then, and then I said, it's sort of like a happening. I'll mix a color and I'll start maybe with a central shape and the color is so beautiful, I'm in, you know, in love with it. And then I'll go to the next shape and then there's like a relationship between those two colors and I think of it maybe as a dialogue. And then the third one comes and it becomes a conversation and the colors are so beautiful. They, it's, it's like perfect at that point. And then you have to throw something in. It, it needs some discordancy, if that's even a word, because it becomes a family and to have an interesting family or an interesting discussion, you need some tension and you need interplay in the composition for it to be you know, interesting. So that's how you know, a painting evolves for me in the studio. And then when I do a series of all these giant colorful things, then I start to pull back when that series is done and then I'll go into another direction. And usually that will be the absence of color. I'll either be going back to the white plaster or going back to, or going to black and white paintings really that are, are very simple or, if it's the summer, maybe the branches are coming out and still I'm back in the arcs and leaves and, and that might be, be, become a series. But the arc and line title of this presentation I thought wasn't exactly accurate because everything's a reaction to what you've made before and what's happening. And, um, but I do have this way to simplify forms and have them you know, relate to one another. And I'm interested in the gesture of, of the forms, maybe not the exact representation of figures or leaves, but you know, how I see them. And I'm hoping that my paintings are pretty welcoming and that people would just look at them and maybe they'll think they're pretty in the beginning. And then, you know, maybe that's welcoming enough that they'll look for a little while and maybe see more into it. I don't have any preconceived idea of what someone needs to see in my paintings. I want them to just engage however they do. And, you know, if I feel like if they're welcomed into like the joy of color, or even when I don't use color, maybe they'll look for a little while and then maybe they'll see more of, you know, a presence. Maybe it's not just pretty. Maybe that's what engages you um, um, initially but then maybe you get a feeling of the presence of the piece and maybe you start to see that it's very bold and, but then if you look at it longer, maybe you see some of the delicacy and um, the more softness about it and that it's, it's a moment in someone's way of seeing something and you can relate to it however you want. And maybe you won't even know it, but maybe since I'm interested in positive and negative shapes, you'll see that. You maybe don't know the name of it, but you know, I think it's just um, an opportunity for people to see how you see something differently. And I find the scale takes something that maybe we see in everyday life and it's, it, it's a different perspective on it. And you know, I hope that that is interesting to people. So what's up now is this black and white series that I did. And then from that, I got into still lifes of vases and leaves and flowers that were extremely colorful, but extremely large. So you had a different perspective of, of vases. And I think that they have, you know, a quietness that you can look at. Maybe you'll first say, oh, that's a beautiful green, or I like that green. 
and then you know maybe you'll engage further. Um, the last piece that I'm going to show is how I was introduced with doing this very large scale concrete, poured concrete outdoor piece that's based on one of the freestanding cutout sculptures in the beginning. And um, it doesn't have any color in it because it's within nature and the ever changing um, you know, scheme of nature. And I think it's bold of me to even be put up something in nature because nature is so beautiful already. But I'm hoping that this last sculpture that I'm showing, that you know, some you can look at it and maybe feel the quietness, maybe have some type of contemplation. I'm not asking anything of you for it. And, you know, I hope that you can engage in nature and see how different people see things and the quietness of it all. Thank you. Thank you, Patricia, for sharing these beautiful images and, and uh, your process. I think it always helps when artists um, talk about their choice of, of forms and colors and, and gesture and how the artworks come about to understand it better. So thank you. Last but not least, uh, our very own uh, director, Monica Ramirez Montagut. So Monica is uh, our director. She's also an architect. Um, she uh, was appointed here in June uh, of this year. We're very lucky to have her. She was also uh, appointed to the National Museums and Libraries Board of Advisors by President Biden. Um, she's a member of the International Council of Museums, or ICOM, in the United States. And she's on the board of directors and the member of the Asso Association of Art Museum Directors, so it all keeps her very busy. Monica served on the U.S. Federal Advisory Committee on International Exhibitions for the Venice Biennial in Washington, D.C., uh, the organization that selected uh, Simon Lee, uh, who was the winner of the Venice Biennial Golden Lion this year. And before joining the parish, Monica was the executive director of the Michigan State University Eli and Edith Broth Art Museum, and the former director of the Newcomb Art Museum of Tulane University in Louisiana. Please welcome Monica. Thank you, Corinne. Um, thank you for everyone to presenting. It's a little bit daunting to follow such terrific presentations, so I will do my best. This is a little bit of an a intuitive journey. I, uh, you know, we've, we've been a little bit busy, so one day I sat down and I prepared the PowerPoint and I was just like, which are the projects that I, that I like most? And so it's kind of like a journey of what I've done, some projects, some of them you will see will perhaps influence some of, of the projects that will be coming up in the, in the parish soon. So this is an image of, um, of an exhibition. This is at the National Building Museum, but it shows my first job as a curator where I, ha where I did my first job, which was in this building. It's a Frank Lloyd Wright building that it's in Oklahoma. It's called the Price Tower. I mean, Frank Lloyd Wright designed it for New York City for St. Mark's, and he called it the, the tree that escaped the forest. Next to that, that um, scale model was an exhibition designed for the 50th anniversary of that building that was uh, designed by Saha Hadid, an Iraqi-born ar uh, architect. And so uh, that job, which had, was a combination of Frank Lloyd Wright and Saha Hadid, took me to this job at the Guggenheim, where I was actually a, an assistant curator for the Saha Hadid retrospective in the Frank Lloyd Wright building. So I was the assistant curator for architecture and design there for about three years. When I finished the Saha Hadid exhibition, I was then given the Tsai Kuo Chang exhibition. It's a Taiwanese artist. We, we had also somewhat of a retrospective. We hung like all these, I think it was 10 cars from the rotunda. And um, we, it was a series of 11 installations. It's been the fastest crash course on anything that could ever go wrong on any kind of installation, like a car falling on the rotunda, or this installation called Head On, where we had 99 wolves, uh, taxidermy wolves, kind of like going up the ramp and crashing into a wall. And it was talking a little bit about um, lack of leadership in, in Taiwan and the China area at the time. And so I learned 
almost everything I needed to know about installation at the Guggenheim. Then I went to the Aldrich Museum in Connecticut, in Richfield, Connecticut, where the job was to find new talent and give artists their first museum show. So this was an exhibition I gave to a very prominent artist now called Cause. That's his a alias name. His name is Brian Donnelly. And interesting, that, that mural, I told him, like, Brian, let's do whatever you want, but nothing in yellow. I hate yellow. So he did a yellow mural. And he said, I did it because you're going to love it. Um, and so this is the ty type of work that he does, needless to say, inspired in popular culture, not in the history of art. So some art critics love to hate him. Regardless, he really uh, is serving a young adult audience. Also at the at the Aldrich, I worked with this Brazilian group, for example, that was called Chelpa Ferro, and we did this kind of like um, new media, uh, high, um, it's not new media, but this tech installation. These were garbage bags that were programmed with a computer with these normal, with these uh, blender machines that they sounded exactly like what, what a carnival in Rio sounds like. And so you would be thinking, I'm walking into that gallery, there's a carnival in Rio, and then you would see all these machines and garbage bags. I thought that was fantastic. I also worked in San Jose, the San Jose Museum of Art in Silicon Valley, California, in an exhibition about food. Uh, San Jose was a, a, an important source of, of food for the rest of the country. This is a mural made by Curry. So you would walk into the galleries by Sita Baumik, and it would have smell. And the previous image was called Prison Gourmet. In California, a lot of the Latino population actually is incarcerated. So there was a performance showing us what, what that kind of food uh, was. Then I moved to uh, Tulane for six years to the Newcomb Art Museum. This was a fantastic show of women from Aboriginal Australia. And this exhibition really resonated with a lot of audiences. These women, this is not um, uh, religious art, but it definitely comes from, from that line of transcendence and inherit, inheriting um, their ancestors' narratives. This is Diana Al-Hadid. Syrian-born artist, American, and she allowed us to frame her work within the Syrian crisis. And um, needless to say, also a very successful exhibition. This was also at Tulane. This was Michelin Thomas. And on the on your left hand side, you can see these kind of stage sets that she created. That that she used to not show them, but now she's showing them where she would create these sets and then take photographs and portray a lot of the series that she's representing in her work. This is an interesting exhibition. It was also at Tulane for the 300th anniversary of New Orleans. It was called Empire, and the artist collective called Fallen Fruit, who will be coming here to the parish and doing a different project, called from the museum collections and turned like the whole museum to look like a cabinet of curiosities and a little bit of the replica of what curators find in storage to allow for everything that we had of the history of New Orleans to be right there at the same time and allow the visitors to actually kind of like curate their own, their own history of New Orleans. It was an impossible project to say we're going to do an exhibition of the 300 years of New Orleans. And so we allowed for these artists to, to create this kind of, of installations. The wallpaper that they do for these very busy exhibitions is a portrait of the region. So each wallpaper actually comes out of like a lot of research from the archives and, and from interviewing stakeholders in the community to deliver these kind of very charged environments. What they will do for us is an exhibition on food uh, and exploring the labor and food in the East End. From Tulane, New Orleans, I moved to Michigan State University. It is an, it's a building designed by Saha Hadid, which takes us back to our, our first slide. And uh, I was there for the last two years. And interestingly enough, it was the 10th anniversary of that building on the same month of our 10th anniversary here. And when I was there, I did have the time to organize a retrospective of the design, architectural design, archi um, industrial design by Saha, which is on view right now in that museum. And, uh, and I think that we need to do a little bit more of, um, I'm going to plug it in, I'm going to do my pitch, a little bit more exhibitions on architecture and design because we have an educated audience and I think we would enjoy that. And another type of works that I also did both at Tulane and at Michigan, and we will also perhaps do here are some exhibitions with some social justice components looking at what are the critical issues that impact our immediate communities. And at Tulane and, uh, at Tulane and Michigan was mass incarceration in the United States. So that's what those two exhibitions, those two 
last slides were about an exhibition on incarcerated women of the United States, and we will perhaps revisit that theme here um, late in 2025 and look at our communities that remain invisible to us. So anyway, uh, thank you for your attention. <laughs> Thank you, Monica. Um, you have arrived here full speed, and uh, I really love the way you redefine art and, and the role of the museum. So I'm really looking forward to uh, a really exciting and vibrant um, calendar of exhibitions coming up. So, And thank you, everyone, for coming out tonight. It's always wonderful to see uh, such a great crowd. Um, thank you.